what is your standard of care for a patient with no driver actual mutations and a PDL1 score greater than 50%? So basically, what do you think Insigna is going to tell us in that cohort? And then uh, relatedly, do you do anything different if PDL1 is stone cold zero on a reliable biopsy? Are there any problems with um, you know, chemo pembro or chemo semiplomab or, or, or whatnot? And so maybe uh, we'll go around Robin, uh, at least from my screen view, uh, starting with, with Dr. Kim. Right, so for PDL1 high, at least 50%, I tend to use immunotherapy, monotherapy, PD1, PDL1 uh, inhibitor, uh, such as pembrolizumab. Uh, unless I think that the patient has a high burden. Disease. That's somewhat subjective. I had to acknowledge that um, because in uh, when, when there's a big tumor uh, sitting you know, near the critical structures, I want to shrink it as much as possible. So there, then uh, I use the combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, even in the setting of um, the uh, PDA1, you know, at, least 50, uh, at least 50%. PDA1 negative, like 0%, um, I use chemo plus immunotherapy. I found the data of nivol map in PDA1 negative and then squamous histology very interesting and probably the best hedge ratio out there. And so I think about using sort of nivol EP based regimen for those specific uh, patient populations. Yeah, I think um, that's a great point. Uh, you know, from my own perspective, uh, we have no firm data, right? So we just have to deal with the data we have in the subgroups. And, and for me, it's uh, basically saying, what's your favorite topping on a pizza, right? There are very few bad choices except pineapple. Then then we got to avoid the pineapples. But uh, uh, really, the, the question is is what to do. And so for me, for PDL one greater than 50%, my null hypothesis is actually chemo pembro, um, or I guess chemo simplimab would be quite reasonable as well now. Um, but the general idea that... Uh, if you look at the curves, there's a little bit of crossover early on for patients who get IO alone. Um, and, and I can't always predict who they are. Often they're SDK 11, keep one, maybe lower tumor mutational burden. Um, but if a patient can tolerate chemo, they're getting the IO along with it. And so for me to kind of hold the chemo part for a PDL and greater than 50% patient, they need to really have low volume disease, maybe be a poor chemotherapy candidate. Um, and then uh, for PDL1 less than 1%, um, I consider anti CTLA4 approaches um, just based on some of the subgroup data. So, um, you'd have to do that with chemotherapy, um, for, for example, checkmate 9LA um, or Poseidon. Um, there's no cross trial comparisons there. Um, it's just the durability of response for PDL1 negative patients um, approaches that of patients with low PDL1 positivity. And so, uh, if one does think about CTLA4, um, which I do, I, I generally consider for PDL1 negative, it's not a wrong choice to give chemo pembro, uh, especially with Keno 189, where the data looks really good in non squamous. But if you look at the squamous data, it doesn't look particularly good for PDL1 negative patients. Some um, it's a smaller subgroup, um, nothing wrong with it. Um, so I, I think we have more questions than answers, um, but we have to make decisions in clinic, and that's just my mental model and how I think about those. Love to hear, uh, Dr. Desai, how do you handle those two cohorts in your clinic? Yeah, I think it, the the practice is quite similar. I think, like you mentioned, PDL one more than fifty percent. Uh, you know, really, I think default is chemo IO, and I really try to find reasons uh, or I identify if there are any reasons not to give chemo, which may include performance status, tolerability, uh, and maybe burden, low tumor burden of disease. So, um, and then for the negative, I agree with you. I think I try to uh, identify. Um, you know factors which 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 would probably lean me towards an anti ctla 4 based regimen although i i will say that i think the dual checkpoint with the with the you know adverse events that i've seen and you know anecdotic anecdotally in patients i i think that is something that we have to very carefully consider um, because with the anti ctla 4 there definitely is you know increased risk of uh, immune related adverse events so that's something that i uh, kind of you know check in more Dr. Leo? Um, I don't have much additional data to, to sort of, or opinion to add to this. Um, I do strongly consider, you know, clinical factors, patient preference, and certainly the impact of commutations. Um, and also thinking about clinical trials, although this is a space, as you said, that we have a lot of options. Given the unanswered questions and subsets of patients, if I have a good clinical trial, that may be an opportunity 
that's interesting for a patient, I'll certainly always consider that and, and discuss that with the patient and their family. Dr. Rattel? Yeah, no, I agree with, I think, a lot of what Finn said. You know, for pdl one high patients, you know, my default is actually IO monotherapy, and I need a reason to add chemotherapy because I'm adding toxicity with that regimen. And why I might add it, one, patients with symptomatic high disease burden where the stakes are really high, I need a response to this first treatment, I'll go chemo IO because it gives you two shots on goal to some extent. Um, the other reason I might do it is, you know, pdl one high is not one population. pdl one 50% is probably very different than pdl one 90%. So the higher that pdl one score, the more likely I am to jump to monotherapy. And the lower that score, 50 or 60%, I'm probably more likely to be leaning towards more easily adding chemo into the regimen. Uh, for pdl one negatives, I'm not treating them differently right now. I do chemo IO without the CTLA-4 addition. I think it adds toxicity. And again, I'm not sure... We have subgroups, but that's tricky and no, no direct comparison. So I'm watching that data very closely, but, but not acting on upon it just yet. And I think the real answer is for all of these populations, if you can find an appropriate first-line clinical trial, that can be a great option. Great point. And Dr. Anger, the age-old question, uh, holding treatment during radiotherapy, whether it be SBRT or SRS, uh, any pearls or high-level evidence on, on what we do uh, for chemo IO strategies versus targeted therapy strategies, or what's your practice? Yeah, <clears throat> there is not a lot of high-level evidence that's asked that specific question. Um, we hold TKIs <clears throat> for a few days um, before and till a few days after the delivery of radiation. Um, you know, there is some suggestion that there could be increased uh, lung toxicity, through, uh, um, and so we 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 don't. Um, we're a little bit less certain about doing that together. And certainly chemo IO we hold uh, for at least on all the trials um, uh, for the radiation to be delivered and then we restart it. Um, you know, I think it's what's gonna be very interesting, you know, we've treated a lot of patients. What's gonna really be interesting is whether the patients that got chemo IO versus monotherapy, IO monotherapy, they had a different toxicity profile. If they've gotten local consolidative therapy, I think you're gonna see that there is gonna be a difference in uh, toxicity um, and whether that's gonna play a role in, in how aggressive we are with the local therapies. Uh, 